away the Irish guy and that is an absolute disgrace. How? How is that a penalty? How? PSG won, Newcastle United won, I am sorry. Of course Eddie looks confused. The clue is in his name. How? How is that a penalty? I am sorry. Sorry, but the Geordies were absolutely robbed. They must feel like Wayne Rooney's wife because they have been cheated. This is a joke. The referee had already turned down a previous spot kick claim because yes, the ball hit Lewis Miley's arm, but only after it had bounced up off his thigh. It's in the rule book. In April, the UEFA board recommended that UEFA should clarify that no handball offense should be called on a player if the ball is previously deflected by, from his own body. I don't understand. Are we just ignoring the rules now? Because PSG were losing? I mean, what next? Would a PSG player be allowed to chop off Jolinta's tongue with a scissors? The referee literally stared at the television replay, watching the ball come off Tino Livermetto's chest before striking the arm. No penalty then. That should have been the only decision. No penalty. But he was too scared to say that in a screaming PSG ground. Or at least I hope he was just scared of nothing else. Oh, we didn't have a free holiday book to Qatar. The ball came at Livermento so quickly that even if it didn't strike his chest and instead just got his arm, and it, it still wouldn't be a penalty. It wasn't in an unnatural position. He was trying to balance his body. I'm sorry, but what was he supposed to do? Play the entire second half with his hands send the tape to his hips? With the way the game is going, I'm half expecting some psycho coach of Bulgaria to start setting a new trend by, yeah, just full on amputating his fullbacks by getting a chainsaw to cut off their arms, we are gonna pour armless leftbacks on the hills of Cyprus before they spend the rest of their days eating breakfast by just shoving their face in the bowl. There is no way that should have been a penalty. It's a dis- it's a disgrace. Newcastle deserved to leave this ground with a win. I mean, do you know what that would have done? It would have put Newcastle in pole position to qualify from the hardest Champions League group. It would mean that the Magpies would be one win away from knocking PSG out. <laughs> I mean, this is supposed to be a new dawn for PSG. The owner has said that he wants to get away from the superficial Galactico failed project and instead focus on hungry young talent. That would have looked like a complete and utter mockery if the club had, for the first time since the Qatari takeover, failed to get out of their Champions League group. I mean, trying to convince Mbappe to stay when they're spending the rest of the season, having European football on Thursday nights, competing for the same trophy as West Ham, Brighton and Rangers, it would have been embarrassing. I'm not saying that a Qatari prince was sneaking money into a VAR official's pocket. No, but what I am saying is that this result completely stinks. As if you're sitting next to chunks on a plane. It's a disgrace. An absolute joke. Nasser al Khalafi, the PSG president. Oh, guess what? He's on the UEFA executive committee. How is that? Fair. This would be the first time that PSG, under this powerful Megabucks ownership, lost a Champions League group stage home match in front of their fans. The first time ever. Yeah, I mean, Man United's group stage win here in 2020 was in front of about four blokes and a mouse. I mean, you could hear Ole Gunnar Solskjaer sneezing on TV. So how unfair is this? Those PSG ultras had never seen their team lose a home Champions League group stage match at the Parc des Princes. Not since December 2004, when, yeah, they lost to Chelsea and CSKA. To put it in context how different PSG were back then, that, um... They had Sol Bamba sitting on the bench. Their midfielders were going to grow up to play for Portsmouth and Sunderland. Their squad was about as talented as a wet egg sandwich. So I get that losing to Newcastle, ruining your wonderful home record would have been embarrassing. But it doesn't mean you should cheat your way to a draw. It is beneath you as a club needing to cheat against a team with a 17-year-old in midfield. It's a bit like if we saw Conor McGregor fighting KSI and only winning the match because he snuck rat poison into JJ's pre-match meal or just begging the referee to overlook the fact that he bites off his nose mid-match. I just have a free bottle of my horrible whiskey. It is a joke. Lat, what is it about handball decisions in Paris? They call it the city of love. No, no, it's the city of blind referees. Does every ref who steps foot into this city for a monster football match that I am watching suddenly immediately forget what the handball rule is? Back in November 2009, I was incandescent with rage. Honestly, I'm glad we couldn't afford silverware in our house. I'm glad back in those days, me and my mum would sit around a dinner table eating mashed potato and noodle soup with our fingers because otherwise I'd have probably stuck a fork in my tongue. After a Thierry Henry handball twice, to knock Ireland out of a World Cup playoff. And I know that reference would be nothing if I were to have told that to the Newcastle squad last night because, lads, it is so long ago now. I mean, it happened when Lewis Miley 
was free. Kylian Mbappe himself was a 10 year old boy whose mom probably used to tell him off for chewing his plastic army toy soldiers. Although lads, can I just say that Lewis Miley is so horrendously young. I don't want to sound like Philip Schofield drooling over teenage photos of JLS, but lads, I am gobsmacked by this kid's age. To put in such a composed, mature, pristine a midfield performance at PSG away on a Champions League night. Lads, when Mbappe won the World Cup, Lewis Miley had just turned 12. He was probably reading all about Mbappe in Match Magazine. In between failing science exams because he thought babies were born out the bum. Ah, maybe that was just me. What I will say though is this. This question fascinates me. So Miley is good enough to compete against PSG in the Champions League. At what age did Miley start becoming a better footballer than me? I mean, wh where is the cutoff point? Because I'm sorry. When Henri chucked in that horror handball that forced me to feel like a vampire chewed up my heart, back then I was at school playing football. Miley was three. I mean, who would you have rather chucked onto a left wing for a match? A teenage me who was scoring goals every month? Or the child that used to poo himself four times a day? Give Miley a ball in 2009. I need to probably try to eat the bloody thing. I'm even gonna say that, that when I was doing daily videos for the 2018 World Cup on that previous channel, which must not be named, I was better at football than Miley then too. He was 12. There is not a single 12 year old on planet Earth who is better at football than me. I refuse to believe. I mean, come on, look at this bicycle kick. Tell me that went in. That went in. <laughs> I'm even gonna say, when Steve Bruce first took the Newcastle job, I was still better at football than a 13-year-old boy. And I know, me continuously obsessing over a 13-year-old Miley. I probably do sound like those middle-aged creeps who were given restraining orders from the Hannah Montana set. Uh, does anyone get that reference at all? Newcastle were incredible. Lads, two years ago, PSG were competing in a Champions League final. In a time where Tesco queues spilled out onto the street, when we were told to wash our hands 16 times a day. Well, just one month before PSG's Champions League final, Newcastle were finishing 13th in the league under Steve Bruce. Expectations were so low that even managing to claw their way to an FA Cup quarter final that summer seemed like some sort of miracle success. Tell any Newcastle fan, after a season where they lost 8 0 on aggregate to Leicester, when they failed to win 31 games of football, oh, tell them, then they just a little over three years, they would be beating PSG in the Champions League 5-2 on aggregate over two group stage matches. That they were seconds away from leaving the Parc des Princes with a win. Oh, and all the while, being coached by the guy who resigned from Bournemouth that summer for finishing 18th in the league. Newcastle and Howe lost a combined 38 league matches that season. PSG, by contrast, lost three. This turnaround does not compute. Lads, Newcastle were not even able to make a single sub because they boasted quite possibly the least threatening bench a Champions League match has ever seen. Sure, they technically had a previous Champions League finalist sitting on the bench, but I mean, whenever Loris carries hears that Champions League mu theme music, it must be more traumatic than being asked to wipe poo if your great granddad's tie. It was a bench consisting of two goalies, Paul Dummett and kids. Old man Dummett probably felt like a babysitter, like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Kindergarten Cop. I mean, what does he have in common with 17-year-old children who live on TikTok? And who can't remember what a Ronaldinho was? Zimbabwe striker Michael Ndwani was on the bench. Alongside teen striker Ben Parkinson. I know nothing about this kid. I mean, I tried to Google Newcastle and Parkinson. But I, I was just given advice on when to submit your granddad to a Whitley Bay nursing home. James Hunley is a 90 year midfielder who was also named on the bench. Who is he? Last month he was probably out trick-or-treating with his mates. How nervous do you think he was? Imagine this little boy seeing Joe Linton going down with cramp. Imagine if he was then asked to make his debut in a ground where Messi recently played, being asked to man-mark Mbappe. He would probably feel a little bit like someone who's had four boxing lessons and then be told to get in the ring with Canelo. So the fact that Newcastle were so good that they should have left the stadium with a win. Incredible. What a performance. Jamal LaSalle was an absolute hero in the center of defense. Fabian Schaar. I'm going to say this now. This guy is the most underrated center back in the Premier League. I think three years ago, he was rolling on Steve Bruce's bench. Failing to get into a back five consisting of Isaac Hayden and Kieran Clark. Make no mistake about it. Schaar is good enough to play for an Arsenal, a Liverpool, a Manchester United, a Bayern Munich, a Barcelona. While Clark is now eating beef burgers on a Stoke City bench. I mean, what was Bruce's problem? Ah, uh, he was definitely just insecure because his wife fancied Char. Newcastle were robbed. They were cheated. Come on, this was an already intense, grueling evening. Because there was a looming, lingering threat from PSG Ultras before the match. To a point where you would scare little Geordies. Literally dressing up in PSG hats to avoid getting punched. Quite ingenious, actually. The level of camouflage is pretty clever. Yeah, he's Adam Pearson. Not Adam Person. Get it? Uh, dump. Dump person. Uh, dump person. Forget it. Lads, Tino Livramento. What a footballer. This was a match where Tino was backwards because Tino was on it. Man of the match in my eyes. An incredible solo run that worked out with Alexander Isak scoring in the opener. Oh, lads, there is no chance that Dan Burns should get back in this team. Oh, but Livramento's not a natural left back. What? 
And you think Byron is? He's your old-fashioned monster center back who is so tall, he probably needs to buy his clothes off the internet. He looks about as comfortable at left back as I do watching horror films with my cat. Forget playing left back in the Champions League. He should be spending his night serving the Adams family their tea. The fact that Livermento's evening was spoiled by technically giving away a penalty. It's a complete and utter joke. PSG did not want to be tossed into the Europa League. They didn't want to have knockout European ties in Glasgow. Although, to be fair, last night PSG seemed like they had more in common with Rangers than they might have thought. Because all of last night, the fans were booing the Pope. Ah, to be fair, Nick was time-wasting, but... So, he is a former team Barry, Harold Burra, Welling United, Cambridge, Aldershot, York City, Barry, and Burnley number one. Someone who was released by his boyhood Ipswich at 16. If he wants to waste time so he can preserve clean sheets against a man who's probably going to lift at least three Ballon d'Ors, then let him. The journey that man has gone on becomes such an incredible shot stopper who is just not phased by Champions League nights. Sure, he's not a great kicker, but so? Neither was Shea Given, and he's a Newcastle legend. Joe Hart has got the kicking skills of a demented grandma, and he's got over 70 England caps. Ozzy Pope was born in the wrong generation. If he he was born in 1980 and was a shot stopper for Tottenham in the mid 2000s. Before goalkeepers were asked to be ball playing sweepers, then I promise you, Nick Pope would have had 100 England caps. He'd have been first choice from 2003 to 2014. He'd have played in at least two World Cups and would be seen as one of the greatest English goalies of all time. Same story with Kieran Trippier. If he was playing in the 90s and the 2000s, Sir Alex Ferguson would have bought him in 1997 and Gary Neville right now would be some irrelevant ex Portsman right back who'd only be seen on television when begging to apply for I'm a Celeb. Trippier and Pope were born in the wrong generation. They would have been England great in another life. Trippier would have over 100 England caps. You know what's scary as well? This referee looks like the twin of the one who cheated Ireland out of the World Cup. Martin Hansen was the ref in Paris in 2009. This time it was Zimian Marchinikak. And I'm sorry, can we check his passport, please? Are we sure this isn't the same bloke in disguise just with minor face surgery? I'm sorry, but from now on, whenever we see a bald ref in Paris, please, 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 can somebody get him an emergency appointment at Specsavers? Can we trawl through his emails so there's no possibility of bribery? Bald refs in Paris are to be feared. I'm sorry, but if your club plays an important game in this city and you see a ref without hair, it really should feel like bumping into Sauron in the queue for Costa Coffee. This is a man who this year, his claim to fame was appearing in the fourth episode of the Polish version of Hell's Kitchen. I mean, is he just too embarrassed to admit that he's blind in one eye? Or did someone serve him a plate of scrambled eggs that causes his brain to malfunction at 10pm on a Tuesday night? It's just so unfair. Newcastle were absolutely robbed. It's a disgrace. Luis Enrique should feel embarrassed that PSG are now in pole position to qualify. They don't deserve it. Dorman have been immense and deserve to top the group. But if you compare the performance levels, PSG have been nowhere near Newcastle's levels. When you factor in the absolute level of horror injuries that Jordi has had to contend with, then uh, grinding out a nil draw at the San Siro Something PSG at home. Fair enough, they were outclassed by Dortmund home and away. But to come seconds away from a win in Paris, with a bench that looks like it was plucked straight off the set of Daddy Daycare, they deserve to go through. Joke! Anyway, that's for one thing. Let me know comments. What do you think? Let me know. What did you make of it? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give a like, subscribe as always. I'll talk to you in a while.